Good morning. I thank President Nancy Pittman and the Phillips Seminary community for this invitation. I'm grateful for the opportunity and appreciative of the conversations that are occurring, even if this is not how I planned and hoped to participate. I bring greetings from Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis with President David Malott and Dean Francisco Lozada. I love the name of the event, Remind and Renew. I'm going to take some liberty here and add another R word. I think it will give you an idea of how I'm approaching not just this presentation, but so many situations, opportunities, and challenges. I'm thinking about this time together as remind and renew and raise, as in raise questions. Big, important, imaginative, fun, timely, discerning, faithful questions. Context matters so much in thinking through specific circumstances and devising strategies that I think a starting point is to identify broad opportunities and articulate key questions. I also want to give thanks for the other presenters for this event and your work, as well as for all of you who are participating. I appreciate you, who you are in the church and in the world, and the work you do in the many kinds of spaces in which ministry places you. I will look forward to hearing via the event app the questions you are asking, how you are sorting through your questions, with whom you're doing that prayerful sorting, and what connections seem to be bubbling up in your context. I've organized my presentation in three parts with the discussion question at the end of each one. The first section will invite reflection on your ministry setting. The second will point to three opportunities for ministry and congregational life. The third will offer thoughts on what pastoral leadership might look like around those opportunities. A little bit more about me, especially because it connects directly with my presentation. In addition to my work at CTS, which is a full-time regular faculty appointment, I'm also serving a congregation for the first time in 15 years. It's a different situation than many. It's not unusual for the senior minister or pastor to be the only full-time staff person and the remaining staff to be a collection of part-time people. But at First Christian Church Frankfurt, the arrangement is essentially flipped. I am the part-time senior minister working alongside some talented, devoted, full-time folks, as well as a collection of talented, devoted, part-time staff members. I'm present and preach most Sundays. Most weeks, I tried to be on site for a couple of days when I focus in ways large and small on the direction of the congregation and on the engagement of the congregation with the local community. I am told that I bring energy to the congregation. I am so glad to hear that because in trying to balance these two different callings, most weeks it feels like an all-out scramble. And yet I'm enjoying the opportunity and enjoying being alongside the people of this particular congregation. This arrangement developed because of a very small pool of ministerial candidates at the time of their search. This shocked a rather privileged and resource-rich congregation that had been able to attract many interested and capable candidates in the past. Some Eurocentric congregations are thinking creatively about pastoral leadership and other staffing arrangements. 
Many more will be forced to rethink assumptions and patterns of pastoral leadership in the very near future if they haven't done so already. A good starting point would be to realize that there's always been a variety of models. This is an opportunity for congregations, denominations, associations, and all the related agencies and schools to offer support in calling forth and equipping gifted and thoughtful leaders who can serve the church well in this new time. In every area of my work, I spend time debating whether everything has changed or nothing has changed. Most of the time, I come away thinking that the answer is yes. Both are true. Perhaps that's why I'm so energized by the mix of experiences. For example, on the side of everything has changed, I'm excited to be teaching a DMIN seminar at CTS in March called New Models of Church. The first thing we will do is formulate our questions about new models. Where and why are new communities of faith popping up? Is this something new? How do you do church, so to speak, on a gaming platform or in a social media app? For what purpose are people coming together? What does together even mean these days? And how rigorous and exacting do we want to be in deciding whether an experience is or is not church. At the same time, I believe some things haven't changed. For me, that means I still love robes and stoles and pipe organs. I think one of the reasons things are going well down at First Christian Church is that enough people and resources remain in the congregation to live as if not much has changed, at least for now. My efforts at urging the congregation to live with the truest and most current picture of itself and the community around it have been appreciated by some, but not all. And a few have completely rejected both the data and the stories that support the data as simply untrue. In other words, yes, things have absolutely changed. But unless there are direct and explicit conversations about the changes, there's still just enough strength and comfort so far to avoid having to talk about what has really changed and the implications. I served as Director of Field Education during my early years at CTS and regularly visited churches where our students were serving. More recently, I embedded courses in congregations which provided the opportunity to make the ecclesial and contextual connections even more concrete and specific. The classes also presented seminary students and congregants alike with real-time reflection. Of the two congregations who, just prior to the pandemic, were attracting large numbers of people under 40 years of age, one stands loosely in the Stone Campbell movement, of which Disciples of Christ are part, features a very good high-energy praise band, a male preacher who roams about in an untucked polo shirt, a stunningly nonchalant approach to communion, and a sense that authentic Christianity has been restored and can be experienced there like nowhere else. 
The other congregation is an Episcopal parish whose worship includes choral music from across the centuries exquisitely performed, significant meditative moments, the physicality of kneeling and crossing and processing and recessing, a diverse staff and membership, and formality and precision that extends to the Eucharist and spoken word and every other movement. So what is happening that these two very different examples of Christian community worship and practice would be able to reach a coveted segment of the population in ways that many congregations do not. And just because it's working now, will it continue to do so even a year or two from now? Or might everything be changing in such a way that even these two congregations will rethink their assumptions and approaches? I rather doubt it, largely because I think both congregations have a certain clarity about them. Both congregations give clear signals about who they are and who they are not, and both weave their theological commitments through worship and programming in unmistakable ways. For congregations whose commitments are less clear and who give interested visitors in person or online far fewer handles with which to understand the congregation, the path is harder. Parsing messages that communicate both radical hospitality and timid neutrality in the interest of welcoming new people and keeping the existing ones happy is exhausting. I don't want to exaggerate the significance of the season we are in, but it's hard to resist doing so. The four years prior to the COVID pandemic were some of the most important years that American Christian congregations have known, and that is the case for several reasons. How congregations entered the pandemic said a lot about how they moved through it and emerged from it. COVID-19 revealed as much as it caused. The demographics of age alone point in many cases to something of a precipice. The identity of congregations and denominations as communities of faith continues to be in transition. The political climate. The climate itself, as we have just finished the hottest year on record again. The church's silence on a whole range of issues related to belonging and human dignity. And sadly, some parts of the church occasionally breaking that silence with fuel fear, fear fueled meanness and violence. All of this and more points to a critical window. At the same time, the four years following the worst of the pandemic will continue to be some of the most important years that American Christian congregations will know. That's not something I need to tell you. You interact with this reality every week. With headwinds this strong, we start to look around for options. One option is just to tend to the grief and try to provide as soft a landing as possible as congregations conclude their ministries and close their doors. In other words, maybe we find ways to ride it out and give thanks that it was a good ride while it lasted. It is, after all, a big ship to turn even after it appears to have become a small boat. 
the ingrained operating systems and the full complement of seemingly irreversible defaults of many congregations do not allow for many updates to download. It's trying to think outside the box with the people who made the box. And not just that, it's trying to think outside the box with the people who are benefiting from the box being exactly the way it is. Another option is to give in to the cry and impulses of the crowd, reset our clocks and calendars, and let it be 2018 again, or 2002, or 1985, or whatever year it seems to be where you live. We can do this in those situations where it's still possible to recover and refresh some previous patterns of church and where some critical mass, measure that as you will, is present to participate. However, the ramp on this approach is incredibly short and very demanding on pastors. The upside is low. Our cherished buildings will continue to exert pressure unless congregations make major moves related to partnerships and relocation. It's also hard to justify keeping the organizational machinery running and all the slots filled in inwardly turned high maintenance congregations. Only the managers are left in some of those situations. They manage elegantly, even as the window on new possibilities draws to a close. The chance of attracting and bridging multiple generations in an environment desperately trying to get back to another era is pretty unlikely. And of course, the call to bless the actual community around us, the community as it really exists now, is difficult to hear while attempting to return to yesteryear. That said, I think we have before us more than just a set of tired, irrelevant, and depressing options. I think opportunities exist and are being pursued in this unbelievable time of change, some things still ring true. I think it's deeper than just being about praise bands or vestments, gems or stained glass windows. I think it really gets to the core of the deepest human experiences. I will describe what I think some of those opportunities are, but first let's have some discussion with one or two people sitting near you. The discussion prompt goes back to the two examples of congregations that I described as having clarity about who they are, who they are not, how they communicate their identity and weave it through the worship and programming of the congregation. Those congregations send clear messages and give people clear handles to help them decide whether to connect, invest, and contribute. How would you assess the messages and handles that your congregation gives about your identity, values, and mission? And what are the opportunities to strengthen them and make them clearer. We'll discuss that question for a few moments.
I believe people today, as perhaps always, are looking for meaning, community, and positive impact. That doesn't mean everyone is looking for those things to come, pack, come packaged the same way. And it certainly doesn't mean that people trust churches to deliver on those things. But as I listen to teenagers and young adults, as well as to people conducting their life reviews in their 80s and 90s, much of what they share can be distilled into the categories of meaning, community, and making a positive impact. That's what I heard in the fall of 2021 when I began interviewing people for my book, Come Again to the Circle. To get things started, I created a list of 15 people I wanted to ask a single question of, what matters now? The conversations, of course, evolved and covered many other things, but that was always the starting point. In the midst of all that has changed and is changing, in the midst of another terrible wave of COVID-19, in the midst of a church trajectory that has been well underway for a while now, what matters now? All 15 gave me recommendations of other people they believed would be great conversation partners. I had some interaction with nearly 90 people, at which time I decided on the 40 I wanted to formally interview. Many of them are ordained, but not all. And thank you, Sacred Scripture, for your symbolism. 40 was exactly the right number as those conversations and interviews were conducted in some strange part of wilderness in the fall of 2021. What I heard and what others have heard and have also written about is that people are craving meaning, community, and positive impact. It's the best news I've heard in a long time. That's what people want? And we're the church? Isn't this our game? Meaning, community, and positive impact in the world? But of course, many don't believe that captures the life and mission of the church. Many are convinced that the church's game is irrelevant ritual, judgmental exclusion, and obsessive self-preservation. Even those who continue to participate in a church might not agree that these three things are at the heart of the faith, but therein lies an opportunity. Meaning. I know we humans express our quest for meaning in some strange and sometimes awful ways. But I believe most people want their lives to make sense. I also believe that many people are capable of, of depth that we don't always give them credit for and that we might even be afraid of. The questions that people ask and the wisdom they share can open conversations that we may not want to take time for. It's also possible that their spiritual and theological quests cause us to disclose more of our deeply held beliefs and commitments than we are comfortable doing so. Reverend Monique Crane Spells, who is Vice President for Mission, Advocacy, and Programs with Disciples Home Missions, described in her interview the importance of ministers sharing with others as our beliefs and commitments evolve. She acknowledges the how of this is critical, I'm sorry, critical, but notes that usually any question or issue being considered by one person is also being considered by many more. If we are growing 
or wrestling with our beliefs. Many will appreciate the honesty of saying so and may even be encouraged to continue their own growth and wrestling. As Wes Granberg Michelson, former head of the Reformed Church in America, put it, if we are not talking in the church about truth, race, and the environment, we shouldn't expect people under 40 years old to look to the church as a conversation partner or as a community where meaning can be nurtured and clarified. It's likely that at a given moment, in a given context, those three examples might change, but the point remains, are we convening and participating in conversations that connect with the biggest and most current issues of our time? Those are the issues on the hearts of many people. In 2008, Phyllis Tickle published The Great Emergence. She already had groupies from around the world, and that book brought even more into the flock. I thought she might have over-concluded in places, but that's not the point of this story. A year later, Ms. Tickle, who died in 2015, was the keynoter at a nearby seminary, one that is more conservative than Phillips or CTS. I wanted to meet her and, if possible, talk with her in person. She was taking questions after one of her presentations. Someone stood up in a very self-congratulatory tone to share with Miss Tickle and all those gathered the good news that the congregation he served was an exceedingly welcome place for persons who are gay or lesbian. To which Miss Tickle responded without hesitation, and remember this was almost 15 years ago, oh, that's already been settled. The current question is the welcome we will give to trans persons, and more importantly, what we will learn about life and faith from them. Many at the gathering did not like that response. But it's like soccer. You can't go where the ball is because it's not going to be there when you get there. You go toward where the action is developing. That's what it means to be current in conversations, practices, and commitments. Phyllis Tickle knew that in many congregations nothing was settled yet, but she looked out on the broader landscape and saw that conversation was moving in that direction. Tragically, many others looked out on the broader landscape and saw where this generously affirming conversation might go and began targeting trans persons for discrimination and violence. Reverend David Galloway, a retired Episcopal priest in the Diocese of Atlanta, named an important possibility, which is that with congregations, we may not have the right vehicle to be a spiritual community that nurtures a theological consciousness. So much time is spent running a local social religious franchise, and so many re rewards come to those who keep the machinery running smoothly that it will take a huge disruption in the life of most congregations to make space for these conversations and to make room for the pain that people are carrying and will carry into these conversations. So crowded is the life of many congregations that we're even distant from our own faith story and from the life and guidance it offers. 
That's why I was so appreciative of Reverend Ron Nunez, who is pastor of Woodruff Place Baptist Church in Indianapolis. When the need for understanding and purpose became evident among a conflicted group of key lay leaders, he turned directly to Bible study, confession, repentance, and reconciliation. A new sense of trust, purpose, and meaning emerged. A second opportunity is community. Our college age kids find something very intriguing and interesting and entertaining about a bizarre sitcom called Community. Last weekend, they were home from school and we watched several episodes together, all of which we had seen before. Production for the show ended in 2014. But if our kids still want us to watch TV with them, you can bet that we're going to do that. Plus, I'm confident that immense learning about community, lowercase c, can occur from this diverse, honest, vulnerable, and quirky collection of characters in the community college where the show is set. I am early on that learning curve, but I'm still leaning in. In the book, Leading Faithful Innovation, three colleagues from Luther Seminary in St. Paul Note the challenging overlap that is occurring between the age of association and the age of authenticity. The age of association, which can be traced from the founding of this country until the late 1960s, was characterized by a strong degree of institutional trust and commitment and a willingness to join and sacrificially serve these organizations. People derived identity from the institutions, except, of course, those who were excluded from those institutions. In the age of authenticity, identity comes from writing one's own story finding one's true self, and enjoying the freedom to express it. Institutions are experienced as restrictive and receive a stinging critique for exclusion and injustice that have been allowed to persist for decades. At the same time, as the authors note, a certain anxiety arises at the thought of writing one's own story thus creating, I believe, a connection between the opportunity for meaning and the opportunity for community. I imagine you have witnessed age of association people and age of authenticity people becoming frustrated with, with each other in the church, questioning each other's degree of true commitment questioning the value of tradition, the freedom desired from we've always done it this way before, and also lifting up how unwelcome even people who have grown up in a church can feel at times. I am drawn to the work on belonging by Cole Arthur Riley, especially in her book, This Here Flesh. Her book, Black Liturgies, Prayers, Poems, and Meditations for Staying Human, has just been released. With what is perhaps good news for the overlap between those two ages I just mentioned, she describes belonging as a gift received and a gift given. There is comfort in being welcome, she says. But there is dignity in knowing that your arrival just shifted a group toward deeper wholeness. She reminds us durable friendship 
is a bond that is able to endure both truth-telling and conflict. Several of my interviewees noted that many youth have no idea there are inclusive churches. I believe that is true. Welcoming supportive congregations are too rare, and some of them have not made themselves easy to find, access, and trust. What if we begin with belonging? What if we say the best B word of them all is belonging? Deep, patient, knowing, and being known. Deep, generous, welcoming, and being welcomed. Not just occupying the same physical space for a couple of hours a week, and not just appearing on the same church roll, but deep growing together. A lot of churches start with a different B word, believing. But what if believing depends on belonging? Audre Lorde said, without community, there is no liberation. There is no promised land without a multitude Who's going to drink all that milk and honey with you? What if the other B words all turned on belonging? What if beholding hinges on belonging? Pictures are coming to my mind right now of people whose presence and whose words expanded and enriched my idea of and my experience of the divine, what if beholding hinges on belonging? What if becoming depends on belonging? How could it not? What contributes more to our growth than belonging? I know we have ground to make up when it comes to community and belonging, an embarrassing amount of ground. But I also hear Phyllis Tickle's voice in my head. What's the current conversation? As some belonging questions are settled at First Christian Church, a pressingly current need is how we can foster belonging for neurodiverse children. That is the conversation in my context. I invite you to think about what it is in yours. A third opportunity is that many people want to make a positive impact. One of my interviewees put it bluntly, we've got to stop doing just enough good to make sure, never th to make sure things never change. That's quite an indictment, and the truth of it stings. It makes us wonder if much of the good we think we are doing may be more for ourselves than anyone else, and maybe a form of job security for the church, because the situation and its underlying systems aren't changing much. At CTS, where I teach, we developed the Faith in Action Project several years ago with the goal to come alongside individuals, families, and communities, connect them to resources and opportunities, and support them as they move out of poverty. Along with public events, a grant program helps faith communities and other organizations scale up their work in disrupting generational poverty and creating an environment of economic mobility out of poverty. I mention this because of what the Faith in Action Project does not do. It does not provide food. It does not provide clothing. It does not provide utility payments or money for housing. The project appreciates those who do those things. Emergency needs will always be with us. 
but the project tries to focus on the systemic level. My observation is that plenty of opportunity exists in both areas to make a positive impact in the area of immediate relief and system change. But that system change has gotten caught up in politically driven propaganda that's attempting to say systems don't even exist. It's all on the individual, they say. The opportunity, I believe, is to equip and empower people for both of these opportunities for positive impact and also to continue to teach and interpret how the systems that are running all around us benefit some and keep others out. As Kentucky artist Kelly Brewer learned from her mom to ask, what are you doing with your privilege? One feature of the landscape right now is what the authors of Leading Faithful Innovation called Seeking the Good Without God. Their point is that God is viewed by many as optional for human flourishing. I mention this phrase for a different reason. It describes a lot of really important and impactful work done in the community by people whose values are very close to our own but they come to those values without a religious background or current religious involvement or interest. Some of them may have once been part of a church, but got tired of endless processes that nicked and dinged their ideas to the point that what was left promised no change or impact. And so they've taken their passion and their talent elsewhere. One opportunity here is that of partnerships. They happen. Congregations partner with schools, community organizations, other religious groups, and sometimes various levels of government. We have a chance to make those partnerships more intentional and to make our participation more robust. An overwhelming majority of people under 30, for example, are deeply concerned about the environment. Creation care seems like a commitment of the church that would open conversations and build relationships. The other opportunity I want to mention is the reintroduction of the concept of agency. It's been said that the cultural support toward predominantly white congregations means they have missed out on the toughening that comes with social and cultural challenges. As a result, we have privileged groups who say that they are at the mercy of whatever local, national, or global trend that comes along. They say if the church is declining, the church is declining. If the church has retreated to itself, that's okay. There's not much we could do anyway. Meanwhile, other individuals, groups, and communities are working away on issues of importance and having a rather remarkable impact. We are not helpless and we are not hopeless. We have agency. Our grief may be undermining it. Our shock at watching people at odds with our values may stop us in our tracks, but we have agency. And when taken up, that agency will serve as its own kind of renewal for us within the church and for partnerships beyond the church. Meaning, community, and positive impact. For this discussion time, I invite you to reflect with one or two people sitting near you on this question. In what ways do people in your ministry setting presently experience meaning, community, and positive impact? 
How can those ways be strengthened? What new ways can be introduced? I hope it is a helpful and rich discussion.
Given the opportunities I've described, what will faithful, imaginative, and courageous pastoral leadership look like? I mentioned that in the fall of 2021, I interviewed 40 religious leaders from around the country, thanks to Zoom, from Queens to Miami to the West Coast and lots of places in between. It was a very fulfilling experience for such a richly wise, talented, committed, and diverse group of people to respond to my invitation. This past fall, wanting to know how people were doing and how things had unfolded since we last talked, I called together six of the interviewees from two years prior. Many of my thoughts in this last section grow out of that conversation from November of this past year. It's a bit of a clunky term, but what I heard people describe is what I'm calling shepherd translators. The shepherd part of that is not new, but in a contentious environment where truth and facts are optional and where there seem to be no constraints on meanness and violence, being a shepherd to a community means more than a light touch of organizational guidance and the steady presence of pastoral care. For example, when the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, answers with, just read your Bible, to a question about how he arrived at his core positions and his worldview, it's a moment that cries out for translation interpretation. I'm thinking about a sermon or a post or a Bible study or an article. When we reflect on that statement and then in fine parliamentary procedure, yield back our time. Perhaps we want to agree with the speaker and then describe what we have read in the Bible. Perhaps we want to challenge the speaker for a slightly clearer statement on what he sees in the Bible and how it informs his positions. Perhaps we want to confront the speaker with the vastly different conclusions we have reached from reading the same Bible. However we might want to approach it, it seems like the speaker has handed us an opportunity in a very attention-grabbing way to engage our own story. That's just one example, comments and events that we can work from to remind and renew our own commitments. It's the kind of shepherding that keeps us connected to our source and our sources and fosters identity and direction. It will involve far more than translation from original languages as we help translate what our findings in Scripture mean for our lives and for the life of the world. Another example of being shepherd translators is the work we will do to keep before the congregations and communities the opportunities I named earlier, meaning, community, positive impact. I hope I have described them in ways that represent a break from the way they have been lived out in the age of association and the age of authenticity. That work will involve convening regular, intentional, explicit, direct, and inclusive conversations. Start small, as we almost always have to do. Learn along the way. Allow meaning and community and positive impact to bubble up. Reflect and keep guiding. Even in the midst of change and grief, Help congregations be clear about what will get our energies and our resources and what we will stop doing and leave behind. People will watch us. They will pay attention to what we are giving ourselves over to. They may devote their time and talents to something else. We don't all carry the same concerns and dreams, but hopefully all of them are guided 
by God's hope and healing. In addition to convening conversations, the work of Shepherd Translators calls for creating experiential learning for people to claim their voice, to feel empowered, and to take the first few steps toward making a contribution. Last summer, I was trying to learn my new context for ministry. I knew there were some key elected officials with whom I wanted to speak, as well as several leaders of local congregations and other astute observers. I decided to take people from the Sunday school class that I teach with me for most of those conversations. It would have taken me years to present the kind of clear picture that those good folks gain firsthand from being present in those conversations. The concrete connections were made on the spot. The imagining how to be involved started no later than the drive home. Later, one of those persons initiated a conversation that I wasn't part of, but it's led to a likely partnership with a nearby elementary school. And to quote Reverend Spells again, we'll need to come out front, show up, and stay on with our conviction and our vulnerability. She reminds us that leaders have coasted too often on hollowed out performance and that people know when we are invested. We already lived with irregular rhythms, but now that pattern is enmeshed. That makes the drain on our spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional well-being all the more real, even as we're trying to recover from the last few years. To shepherd anyone, to translate any discomfort into opportunity, depends on being sustained in health by the Spirit, by a supportive community, and by our own practices. We're back to that question I asked in 2021. What matters now? And it's what matters to you and your context. At a memorial service in another city last spring, I learned that not only had the elders of that congregation read my book and discussed it, but that the very agitated elder who broke this news to me the one facing me up close in that moment had serious concerns about some of the things I had said. It comes with the territory. I understand that. But I told him, John, I'll come back and argue with you if you want. But I think it's a better use of your time and my time if you allow the book to launch into a deeper understanding of your own congregation and setting. We answer the question, what matters now in one way or another? My hope is that we are moving beyond a perfectly pleasant, non-bonding study group with a plate of brownies to engage in a more pressing, fulfilling set of questions and opportunities of meaning, community, and positive impact. Answering the question what matters now isn't answering it to me or to anyone else. It's answering it to the congregation and to the context, with the congregation and with the context. The discussion questions for this final segment are what opportunities exist presently and what opportunities can you create to shepherd people through this challenging time and to begin to translate the opportunities for meaning, community, and positive impact in your context. And what is giving you life in this season of ministry? 
And how can you stay close to this or other life-giving experiences?
Thank you again for the opportunity to share some of these reflections. You have my prayers and very best wishes.